Oh, I lost the clock. <laughs> Good morning, dear church family. I just wanted to share a scripture with you this morning. It's from the Apostle Paul in Philippians. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so we do rejoice that God is in control. And it says, in everything by prayer. And so the last couple of days, we were doing a, a yard sale. And God gave us beautiful weather, brought up plenty of people, and just completely blessed it. And because he cares about why it was held. And so we know that God cares about everything. And when we think about a peace that we can't even understand, um, it's such an amazing scripture. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. We thank you for your hand in everything we do, Lord, for the peace that we don't even understand. So, Lord, I pray for today's service. I pray for the worship team and for Sean as he brings the word and for Ray as he brings communion to us, Lord. Just so many ways that we can say we love you. So it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. All right, let's all stand. Open the eyes. 
one more time. Holy, holy. pray that you would open our eyes to your heart, Lord, and that we would realize our need for you, Lord, that we would call out to you, we would humble ourselves before you.
Good morning. You could be seated, please. How's everyone doing this morning? Great. That's what we want to hear. Uh, at this time, we'd like to have a, a, a time of communion. And you know, communion is one of, the, of course, the ordinances that we are called to uh, to exercise in our Christian walks. And we know by by Acts 2.42 that the early church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and what? In the breaking of bread and in prayer. You know, so it is a blessing that a, as a church, as, as a, a body of believers who are like-minded in the Lord, you know, we placed our faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we received that amazing free gift of salvation. And, and it's all made possible, of course, by that his work at the cross, right? Um, and it was all by his grace and love for us that now we have eternal life promised to us. Uh, as we come to the Lord's table in communion, we should not see it as some ritual, but we should see it as a special time, a true celebration uh, on the fact that we could come before his presence and reverence him with a thankful heart, remember, remembering him and acknowledging that awesome work that he did for us at the cross. And he did uh, go willingly to the cross for every one of us. And we know it was his love for us sinners that kept him on that cross. So in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You know, so we celebrate his death because it was his broken body and shedding of his blood that freed us from the power of sin and death. In uh, Isaiah 53, 5, it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So it was his perfect sacrifice that served as a substitute for us sinners who do fall short of the glory of God, he paid that debt that we could never pay on our own, right? The price was paid through the cross of grace. He took the penalty for all of our sins that we would not be judged, but instead have that eternal life. And it's a good reason, of course, to come together in communion to celebrate that. You know, the word tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And the blood that he shed for us has given us complete forgiveness of our sins. You know, through his sacrifice, we're no longer condemned people, but a forgiving people. We are fully redeemed by the blood of Christ. And, and that's a blessing for every one of us. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. So as we remember the cross, we're mindful of the fact that the cross represents his grace, the cross represents his mercy, the cross represents his unconditional for, uh, love for every one of us, and ultimately it reminds us of the hope that we have in him. So as we distribute uh, the, the elements, it's important for each of us really to take a few minutes to examine our hearts and just to uh, um, uh, confess any unconfessed sin to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. For those of you who do not know the Lord, uh, I would ask that you would, uh, uh, at this time in, in, in the silence of your heart, accept him as your Lord and Savior, and you could also partake in, in this great uh, celebration. So let's go ahead and distribute the elements, please.
So each of you have been handed uh, uh, two elements, of course, a piece of bread that is symbolic of his body that was broken for us, and the juice symbolic of the blood that he shed at the cross for us, and then one will be partaking of each separately. But in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 24, it says, For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together of the bread, please. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's partake. Lord, we do thank you that we have every reason to celebrate communion because you went willingly to the cross. It was all by your grace. It was all by your mercy. It was all by your love that you went to the cross willingly to suffer and just take on all the sins of the world, that we would be a redeemed people, Lord. Thank you. We acknowledge that. And we ask that you just continue just to lead and guide our every step, Lord, that everything we do would be uh, in accordance to your will. And thank you that we now have your Holy Spirit to help us to live a life that's worthy of your calling, Lord. So be with us this morning. As the word goes out, Lord, that it would encourage your people in a powerful way. In Jesus' name.
Good morning, family. It's beautiful outside. I don't know who would ever want to go camping. I don't like mosquitoes. <laughs> They're like little terrorists. All right. Uh, pull out your bulletins. Let's see what we have going on this week. Uh, today, after uh, second service, there'll be a principles and ministry class. If you are involved in ministry, you are encouraged to show up. Um, supper for six. So there is a little bit of misinformation there. Not mistaken information? I don't know. Um, all the groups have been put together, and you will be contacted soon to know where to go. Um, Randy said, if you have any questions, that's normal. Uh, you can see him. At, he'll be out in the uh, lobby, and uh, he'll answer any questions you got. Uh, this Wednesday night, we're going to be doing potluck here. So every uh, Wednesday, we have a midweek service, but uh, every other Wednesday, we're going to be doing um, potluck here. So Bring a main dish and bring it. All right, so that's going to be this Wednesday. And uh, it's at 545 so that we have time to eat and then have service. Uh, ladies, slight change in the summer schedule. It looks like you guys got really busy for a minute there. I thought the ladies' stuff was canceled for the summer, but you guys got a ton of stuff to do. It says, please join uh, Monday evening Bible study at 6 p.m. as we continue through First Peter. And join us on the following nights at 6 p.m. for potluck and bunko. So there's a, uh, some nights that are listed there. And Bunko, if you're unfamiliar with that, um, what that is is, ladies, you bring all the clean laundry from the house, and you guys put it in a pile, and you see who can fold the fastest. It's really a neat game. <laughs> That's not what it is at all, and I don't know what it is, <laughs> so <laughs> it might be that. Culture Impact Team, uh, they're going to be meeting on Sunday, June 25th at 1 p.m. here at the church. Uh, you can contact Kendra. Her number's there. Uh, if you have any questions about it. And then a men's conference is coming up in July. So guys, get signed up for that. There's a $30 fee, but um, it's Arise. And there's a verse out of Isaiah 60, uh, verse 1, that says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. So uh, guys, get signed up. It's a two-day deal. And uh, if you have any questions, you can talk with Pastor Ray. And ladies, see, you got more stuff going on. Uh, you're invited to our summer prayer brunch so all the details are there, and it's fervent prayer for America, so that's all very important. And then uh, Grief Share, uh, there will be a seminar on July 16th, so read through that. And if you have any uh, questions about that, you can contact Doug or Tanya Lynch. They head that up. And then there will be a Grief Share class that will start up later in August. Um, oh, and the one-year Bible plan. Who's still doing it? You don't have to raise your hand. Oh, man, so many people. That's good. Um, yeah, so there it is, and I think there's more in the foyer if you need one, but with that, um, say hi to one another, grab some coffee, and come back for some more worship in the Word.
All right, we're going to continue in some more worship if you want to take your seat. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you are worthy, and Lord, that it is all about you. Help us to keep that in mind, Lord. Just pray that you'd fill me with your spirit this morning as I try to get what you've put in my heart out. Lord, that, uh, that you just give me calm nerves and, and that uh, it would be clear, Lord, if there's anything that doesn't belong, that it just be not heard. We thank you for this time together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, church. I'm Sean. I'm one of the elders here. Pastor Jason ran away. He's, uh, he's teaching at a men's retreat. He's doing his, his fifth message for the weekend this morning. So he's been uh, studying up and getting prepared for this retreat. And 
me and the guys have been covering for him on Wednesday nights and, and this morning here. But I got a note from him last night. Sounds like he's ready to come home, but uh, that it's going well. You know, I was looking at this thing. That's a little intimidating now. When it was on my little screen, it didn't look so bad, but it's a little scary. When we were leaving the house, I told my wife I should have brought my smartwatch because I'm missing out on getting credit for two hour-long cardio workouts standing up here. But we've just finished up this deep dive on the fruit of the Spirit. If you've been with us for the last several weeks, a few months, and this morning I'd like to take a look at that Spirit who gives us these fruits and, and how He relates to us, how He relates to His people. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We've studied that exhaustively, but there's so much there still. These nine characteristics, you might call those Christian virtues now, something that we aspire to reflect in our lives. But as I'm going through this list of nine characteristics, I noticed something that I thought was interesting. There's three groups of three. That's how nine works. Three plus three plus three. Love, joy, peace. Long suffering, or if you've got a modern translation, it might say patience, kindness, and goodness go together. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self control go together. They're all godly behaviors that we want, but I also see the Godhead, and we're going to talk about that this morning in these three groups. We talk about the love of God, the peace of God, the joy of God. And patience and kindness and gentleness, that sounds like Jesus to me. And faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, that's what we get from the Spirit if we're listening to Him and obeying Him. So these are called the fruit of the Spirit, but they're on full display in Jesus. You see every one of these attributes, and they describe the Father as well. It's not something limited to just the Spirit. And this kind of gets us into a discussion of the Trinity. It's a fancy word that I'm sure you've heard. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. There's a Bible scholar named Dr. Ed Hinson. He was a dean at Liberty University when I was going there. And he said, the biblical concept of the Trinity is that of tri-unity. Modalism mistakenly defines the Trinity as one God who reveals himself in three different modes. And tritheism falsely views the Trinity as three separate but cooperating gods. Now, there are people who refuse to believe in the Trinity because the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. So they don't, they don't see that, and, and they'll look at Jesus differently or they'll look at the Spirit differently. I, I used to serve with a fellow when I was in the Navy, and uh, we called him the Bible editor because he'd be sitting in the back of the shop with a black highlighter lining out verses that seemed to support the Trinity, redacting his Bible. So we called him the Bible editor. This was before I knew anything, before I was a believer. Some people might say, I don't believe the Trinity because I can't understand it. I can't get an intellectual grasp on it. So I won't believe that if I can't understand it. I'm a person who's like driven by logic. I want to figure out how things work. I want to understand how things are. But occasionally that's not possible. Occasionally we have to step out on faith. Sometimes we'll have an idea that we'll just dismiss, dismiss out of hand completely because we've looked into it and there's just no evidence to support it. It's just a silly idea. There's not enough evidence. It doesn't make sense. Other times we might look at an idea or a thought and there'll be a little bit of evidence that makes sense but not quite enough to convince you because there's other evidence that kind of sways you in the other direction. Not enough to keep the idea, but not enough to dismiss the idea altogether e either. So we have to keep an open mind and we have to investigate further or look further to find more evidence or more reason to believe that thing or to, to think that it's true. All the while, we're, we're pursuing truth. That's the goal of, of you know, doing a intellectual investigation or any other kind of investigation. We want to find out what is true and what is false. That's the basis of the scientific method. 
or at least it used to be. It's gotten politicized. But when we hit that point of not being able to move further and not having enough evidence to fully believe it, but not having enough evidence to fully dismiss it, that's where faith can come in. We can step out and use a measure of faith to believe it. We can believe something's true, even though we cannot fully explain it or comprehend it. Now, if you find yourself in that first camp that just says, I'm not going to believe it if I can't completely understand it, a lot of people will do that. So if you're one of those people, I'd like you to explain to me gravity. How does gravity work? Very curious about that. I know it's true. I know it works. I don't know how it works. Or the electromagnetic spectrum. That's another one that's interesting. We, we understand these things. We know how to exploit them, make use of them, but we can't fully explain them. So is it too much to ask that we believe in a God that we can't fully explain? We've got these evidences all around us in our physical life that we believe and we trust, but we can't explain, and we don't think twice about it. So Dr. Henson there, he mentioned a couple of errant views, or heresies, as they're properly called. The first one was modalism, he said. That's the old Sibelian heresy that goes way back to the early church. And this is a view that, that God is one individual, or one being, or one essence, but he manifests himself as the Father, or the Son, or the Holy Spirit. Not as distinct, coexistent persons, but one at a time. So if God is being the Father, there is no Jesus and there is no Holy Spirit. If God is being the Son, there's no Father, there's no Spirit. You get the idea. Some people like to use water as an example of the Trinity. You know, let's say, oh, water, it can be a liquid, or it can be a solid, or it can be a vapor, a gas. But if you take a single water molecule, that has to be either a liquid or a solid or a gas. It can't be all three at once. So using water as an example of the Trinity is really demonstrating modalism or this idea that one thing has to be one of three things. Now, for the real smart people who want to introduce plasma, the fourth state of matter, that just breaks the uh, equation down even further because you can't, you can't use the finite to explain the infinite. You can't use creation to completely explain the creator. And then the other false view that he mentioned was tritheism. And this is a belief that there's three distinct gods. There's a God called the Father, there's a God called the Son, and then there's a God called the Holy Spirit. And they work together. They're one in purpose or one in mission, but they're three distinct beings, three distinct essences. They're one in the sense that a team is one, but they're three separate members of that team with three individual persons, personhoods. The Muslims will often accuse Christians of being polytheists because of this. They don't understand the Trinity as we're going to look at it. You'll see Muslims doing this a lot of times in pictures. What they're saying is there's one God and he has no son. That's what that means. So they'll say we're not monotheistic. Sometimes the Jews will say we're not monotheistic. But a fancy theological description of the Trinity within the Godhead, this relationship that they share, would be something like, like the, well, you know, I've used the word Godhead a few times. We're going to look at that as well. We need to define that just so nobody's wondering what I'm talking about. But first, that theological description of the Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in substance or essence or divinity. They're the same thing, yet they're three separate distinct persons. Again, we're limited by our finite ability and our finite environment to describe something infinite, to describe God. So it's never going to be a perfect explanation. You know, it's like if you go and you look at a painting in a museum. You can look at that painting, and you might be able to see the name and know who painted it. You might know when they painted it. You might know why they painted it. You might know what it's about. 
But that doesn't mean that that painting is telling you everything about that artist. You learn a few things, but not everything. It gives a very limited description of its creator. So back in the 12th or 13th century, someone came up with this idea of a graphical representation of the Godhead. It's called the Shield of the Trinity. And it represents 12 propositions about the Godhead. This is it here. <clears throat> and what it says is, the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And God is the Father, and God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. But the Father is not the Son, and the Father is not the Spirit. And the Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Son. That's the Godhead, the Trinity, the relationship between them. Again, not perfect because we're trying to describe something infinite with our finite minds. So this word Godhead that I keep using, it comes from the Greek word, theotis is the Greek word. And you hear that word the, theo in there, right? And theotis means divinity, or we could say godness, that God quality of God. Modern translations would translate it as the divine nature rather than the Godhead. Same Greek word, though. And you can hear that root, theo, theos, where we get the word God, like theology, the study of God, or the theotis, theotis, the godness. Anybody here named Theodore or Dorothy? That name means God's gift. So Romans eight, or Romans one, sorry, Romans one eighteen through twenty. It says, "For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead." so that they are without excuse. What that's saying is that we can look around us in nature, anybody can look around them in nature, and if they are thoughtful and quizzical, they'll see that it didn't just happen. There's design, which means there's a designer. So notice that in these verses here, this idea of Godhead refers back to a creator, talking about how he makes himself known in creation. If you continue to read that section of Romans 1, it's very familiar to us. It goes on and it talks about how God is the judge in the verses that follow. In Colossians 2, 8 and 10, we can read, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, that is in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Saying Jesus is the visible version of the Godhead. The Godness, that divine nature of God, is explicitly applied to Christ here. It's saying that Christ is part of the Godhead. But if we look at Colossians 1, 15 and 16, it tells us that Christ is the creator of all things. And 2 Corinthians 5, 10 tells us that he sits on the judgment seat, the bema seat, and judges all of our deeds, whether good or bad. And if you look at Revelation 20, you see the great white throne judgment taking place, and it sure looks like Jesus is sitting on that one too. So he has that judgment aspect of God. The point of all this is, is to show that the one described as having a divine nature, the Godhead in those verses we read in Romans and Colossians, has been called out by name as Jesus in the other verses. There's a lot of groups out there that will deny that Jesus is God, that Jesus is divine. They'll say he's a great teacher, or he, he has... Uh, divinity to him, but he's not deity. He's not God. But we can deduce from reading these few scriptures 
that Jesus has that same divine God nature as God the Father. So all this business about the Trinity that we're getting into here doesn't have much to do with the prepositions of the Holy Spirit yet, but we have to understand this idea of, of a Godhead and what that is made up of in order to get to this main point this morning, which is the Holy Spirit. So the question is, what is the Holy Spirit? That's the wrong question. The question should be, who is the Holy Spirit? Because we just established that the Holy Spirit is in the Godhead. He is a person, not a force. The Holy Spirit is God. He's co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and with the Son. He didn't come along afterwards. He's been there since the beginning. He's not some disconnected essence that floats around in the ether that we try to tap into and feel the divine flowing through us. He is God. And he goes back to the very beginning. If you look at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. A little bit later, at the time of the flood, Genesis 6, 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. We don't quite get that far anymore. Last week, Jason mentioned that it was Pentecost last Sunday. <clears throat> now, that first Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection, that's historically or traditionally the, the birth of the church, we'll call it. And the Spirit of God operated a little bit differently before that day, before that first Pentecost after the resurrection. It was not the first Pentecost. It was the first Pentecost after the resurrection. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. You've got to throw that in there. That word is also translated as breath or wind. So you can hear that ruach, the breath. In the Old Testament, we read so many times that the Spirit of God came upon so-and-so, and they were able to do amazing things. But the Spirit might not always stay with that individual. He might go away. Numbers 24, too, we read the story of Balaam. And remember, Balak had hired Balaam to come in and curse the Israelites. And Balaam tried to do it, but he couldn't. Verse 2 said that Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. That happened to several of the judges, too. It happened to Gideon and Othniel and Jephthah and Samson. Judges 6, 34 talks about Gideon. Remember Gideon destroyed the, ba the, the altar of ba Baal and then he had to fight the Midianites and he had to go down and get his army of 300 guys. Verse 34 says that, but the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet and the Abiezrites gathered behind him. Samson, we know Samson. Judges 15 14 and 15, when he, Samson, came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out with his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. But then, a few verses later, in Judges 16, 20, Samson got a haircut. And Delilah said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep. And she'd, you know, he'd been going back and forth with her. She'd say, why are you so strong? And he'd say, oh, it's because of this. And so she tried to trick him, and it wouldn't work. Finally, he told her, it's because my hair is long. So she cut his hair off. So she says, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep and said, I'll go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know. 
that the Lord had departed from him. Now, if you want to make some money, I get choked up. You could do one of those, like, football pools. How many times will Sean choke up while he's teaching? 2 Samuel 11, 6, King Saul. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard the news, and his anger was greatly aroused. This is when David was becoming the guy. 1 Samuel 16, 14, though, says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a, distress, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. King David. Now that was 1 Samuel 16, 14, that the spirit left Saul. 1 Samuel 16, 13, the verse before, David. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. But what did David pray? In Psalm 51, after his sin with Bathsheba, verses 10 and 11, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. Did anybody just hear Keith Green? Take not your Holy Spirit. The judges... And the kings experienced the Spirit being upon them, but so did the prophets. More examples. Isaiah, Isaiah 61.1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Jesus quoted those verses when he was talking in the synagogue. The prophet Ezekiel 11.5, And he said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in this city, who say, the time is not near to build houses. The city is the cauldron, and we are the meat. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. Then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said to me, Speak, thus says the Lord. Thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, etc. Sounds like a planning commission meeting. Micah 3.8, Micah the prophet, but truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. His sin. So these examples are, are meant to show how the, the Spirit works selectively in people in the Old Testament to accomplish God's will. He'll come in, do what needs doing, and if necessary, leave. He'd come and go as, as was uh, needed to empower those individuals for the specific purpose. So that way of interacting with people and, and several pre-incarnate appearances or what we call theophanies where the angel of the Lord, it says in the Bible, but that's like God coming down in human form. That's largely how God interacted with his people in the time of the Old Testament. Until one evening in Bethlehem, a couple thousand years ago. Things are a little different in the New Testament. Luke chapter 1, 26 through 35, the story of Mary and the announcement from Gabriel. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come to the angel... And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have never known a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Holy Spirit came upon Mary. 
Hopefully you know the story well enough that we don't have to go through the whole thing and we can skip to the good part at the end. The last few years of Jesus' life, his public ministry, God is now on the earth in human form, walking among his people, working with those who he wants to save, doing the work of God personally, not sending somebody else to do the work of God. God is doing the salvation work himself. And it's curious, I didn't realize this, I just stumbled across this, but in the New Testament, during the life of Jesus, the only time we see the Holy Spirit descending upon someone, the only time is during the baptism of Jesus. Mark 1, 4 through 11. It says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for the, sins, for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and all those from Jerusalem went out to him. And were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, Jesus saw the heavens parting, and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There's very few events in the life of Jesus that show up in all four Gospels. This is one of them, his baptism. Most of the others have to do with his crucifixion and the Passion. But the Spirit descending upon him, that shows up in every one of the Gospels. This baptism scene also demonstrates this idea of the Trinity being divine or being the Godhead. We see the Son in the water. We see the Spirit descending like a dove. And we hear the Father speaking from heaven. Now, Jesus was baptized not for the remission of sin, like everybody else was there. That's what John said. I'm baptizing for the remission of sin. No, Jesus was baptized so that he could be identified and recognized as the Lamb of God. And that would probably do it. You'd see the heavens parting and the Spirit coming upon it, and then a voice out of the heavens. And this began his public ministry. It's like, ah, this is the guy. And he called his disciples to follow him, and he lived with them. And taught them about the Father and the kingdom of God. They followed him and they watched him. They loved him. But not as much as he loved them. They listened as he told them about what would happen to him. But they didn't understand. They got excited about spiritual breakthroughs and miracles. They got frustrated and discouraged when people didn't respond. They got frightened. When opposition came their way, or if the wind blew too hard across the lake. They encountered many difficulties, those disciples did. But they were with Jesus, and he gave them comfort. A familiar passage from John 14 reads, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is telling his guys about his death and his resurrection his departure to heaven and his return to earth. But they're not getting it. In verse 5, Thomas said to him, how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and you have seen him. 
Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus said to him, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? But the Father who dwells in me does the work. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. That, that Godhead. They're, they're both God, all three of them. So we see this indwelling, this abiding relationship between the Father and the Son. From a human perspective, that's kind of beyond our experience, you know, that one person exists in another person. The, the closest thing I could think of was like a pregnant woman who has a baby in the womb, but that's not what we're talking about here. Nicodemus got stuck on this same kind of concept when Jesus told him, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus could not comprehend this relationship. So God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit, they're the same essence, they're the same divine thing, the same theotes, as we said. They're not part of the same divine thing. They're each fully the same thing as the other. Remember Colossians 2.9, for in him, that is in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christ is the physical, bodily, human representation of God. When he was here, God was here. If you think of God the Father, and you see an old man in a long white robe with a flowing beard, you've got the wrong picture. You're thinking of Charlton Heston. <laughs> or maybe you're thinking of Father Time from Rudolph's shiny new year. Neither of those guys are God the Father. You can maybe blame Michelangelo, his 16th century fresco, the creation of Adam that sits on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And this isn't even a biblical rendering of the creation of Adam. Michelangelo used his creative license here. This is a very famous painting, the creation of Adam. The biblical account, though, Genesis 2-7 records Adam's creation like this, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God breathed the breath of life into Adam. And that breath of God, it's very similar in meaning to the Ruach. But the Hebrew word here for breath of life is, is more technical. It's more about that, that vital, that life-giving breath that Adam needed to become a living soul. This whole finger-touching thing, that's, that's, that's E.T. That's not the Bible. So if you have any mental picture of God the Father, it's incorrect. John 4.24, Jesus said that God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. After Jesus' resurrection, he's in the upper room with the guys. And he gives us another clue about what it means to be spirit or what it means to not be spirit. In Luke 24, 39, he says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. So if God is spirit, he's not the old man with the long white beard. He is, as Jesus told Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So if you want to know what the Father looks like, it looks like Jesus. But the Father is spirit. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And Jesus is doing the work of God personally while he's on the earth. He's teaching his disciples about God and how to do the will of God. And he's trying to help them understand that his time is limited and his purpose is specific. That he is their helper and their comforter. John 14, again, verses 21 through 31, or 12 through 31. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me. The works that I do, he will do also. 
and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. And the Father, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Not limited time. Jesus speaks of another helper. There's two words here that we want to take a look at, the word another and the word helper. There's a couple of Greek words that can be translated as another. One of them is heteros, which means another of a different kind. And the other is alos, which means another of the same kind. Can mean that. They're kind of interchangeable. But the Greek word used, used here for another is alos, another of the same kind. Jesus is going to send a helper that's just like Jesus. Now this other word is helper that we want to look at. The Greek word here is parakletos, parakletos, not parakeet. Sounds like parakeet, but it's parakletos, helper. This word's also translated as advocate, comforter, counselor, intercessor. Depends on what your Bible version is. But the idea is that it's this assistant. Somebody might be like a, a, a lawyer for you in a courtroom or a mediator for you or somebody who just comforts you. Somebody who encourages you and consoles you on behalf of another person. Just like Jesus did for his guys. The disciples were going to have another helper, another person to do these things and more. And he would abide with them forever. The helper, John 14, 17 says, is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. This new helper is the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. That's who Jesus is talking about. There's three prepositions, finally the prepositions of the Holy Spirit that we want to get to and they show a progression, a progression of the relationship between God and man. The first preposition is para. Para in the Greek. It means with. He dwells with you. Para is a prefix that we use in, in English. We have paralegals. They work with lawyers. We have paramedics. They work with doctors. You can tell a parable. It will take one story and compare it with another. Parallel. You have two things that are the same. The, the other part of that word, para, with, Alel is from alos, another of the same type. So the Holy Spirit dwells alongside or with people. And he has influence upon them. For the unbeliever, this might look like their conscience is bothering them. Or maybe they have recurring thoughts about God that they can't escape. Because we're told in Ephesians that God draws us, right? The believer, however somebody who's truly surrendered their life to the Lord, they get to level up to the next relationship. Because it says the spirit of truth dwells with you and will be in you. The second preposition is en. Sounds just like the English word in. And that's exactly what it means. It means to be in or to be with in or to be along or among rather. This is another common prefix that we still use in English. Enthusiasm. That comes from en and theos. It means to be with God, or to, to, to have God in you, to be possessed by a God, and you get enthusiastic. Encroach. Just to put your hooks in to somebody else's property. Endure. To test the durability of something. Encipher. To put something into a code. Energy. The power or the ergs within it, or in shroud to wrap something in a cloak. We use that prefix N a lot still. The Holy Spirit is in the believer. The Spirit of God has taken up residence within us. The life of the Christian is now enabled to do the will of God. We don't have to do it in the power of the flesh. A.W. Tozer said, the Holy Spirit is not a luxury meant to make deluxe Christians. 
as an illuminated frontispiece and a leather binding make a deluxe book. The Spirit is an imperative necessity. Only the eternal Spirit can do eternal deeds. We'll often say, Jesus lives in my heart. Right? And well, technically that could be true if we recognize that Jesus is the Holy Spirit of God and we see our heart as representative of our spiritual nature. That's a true statement. But it can paint a misleading path, a uh, misleading picture rather, and confuse, uh, confuse people, confuse children. They might actually think there's a little Jesus man living in their chest and not understand that. Or adults may not understand it and hear you say it and think you're cuckoo. <laughs> Why do you think there's a person living inside your heart? The indwelling of the Spirit is also not some latent divine spark within that needs to be fanned into a spiritual light within. It's the God of the universe dwelling in our spirit to the extent that we permit him to. Paul warned the Thessalonians at the close of his first epistle. He said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 22, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of Christ Jesus for you. And do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Do not quench the Spirit. Well, that wasn't good. I just shut my... <laughs> so Jesus is continuing to prepare his disciples, his followers, for what's coming next. But they just don't get it. He tells them in, in uh, verse 25 here, These things I've spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave you with, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The Spirit will bring things to their remembrance. Have you ever had that happen where you're just having a conversation and stuff just starts coming out and you don't know where it's coming from? Verses that you didn't know you knew. That's the verse. He continues on in verse 28. He says, You've heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. In John 15, Jesus addresses how relationships work between uh, believers and how they should relate to him, how we should abide in the vine as a branch does. He talks about how believers should relate to each other. We should love one another. He talks about how believers should relate to the world by expecting hatred and persecution from it because we represent a godly standard of behavior. We represent everything the world does not want to acknowledge as true and does not want to submit to. So its will would be to do away with us. And you see that happening now. It's happened throughout history. They'll be so backwards at some point that they'll think they're doing God's work by destroying God's people. John 16 starts out, it says, These things I've spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will tell you to do, and these things they will do to you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when it time comes, when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you to comfort you. Carries on in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. <laughs> Hanging around Jesus is good. It was good for the disciples. But it's better to have the Spirit of God dwelling in you to give you the power to do those eternal deeds. That's not a, 
intended to sound like I'm being dismissive, dismissive of Jesus. But this is what he was telling his guys. It's better if I'm out of the picture so that the Spirit can come and be in you and empower you. And when he, when the Spirit has come, he'll convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He's saying that we're able to bear and understand and trust better with the Spirit in us than with Jesus just comforting us. And that's what he wants for his disciples. Plus, you know, good to get out of here. And then the trial came and the crucifixion and the death. The disciples couldn't believe it. The Lord was gone. They're left alone. Jesus is dead. The comforter hasn't arrived yet. They're confused. They're scared, senseless. They're filled with doubt and anxiety. Now somebody's come and stolen the body away from the grave. And they don't know what to do. So they hide in the room and they shut the doors. And Jesus appears inside. were terrified and he said to them peace be to you he said it's okay and when he had said this he showed them his hands and his side then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord so Jesus said to them again peace to you as the father has sent me I also send you and when he had sinned this when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And they were glad and rejoiced. And then he gave them their marching orders. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Luke tells it like this in Acts. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not, not many days from now. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then he was received up into heaven. Now, if you're doing your one-year Bible reading, today's verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound of heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That whole scene that G Jason described last week, you know, where foreigners were in town for the, for the feasts and they were hearing these Galileans speak in their own languages from all over the world. Something very powerful was happening there. They'd been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And this brings us to our third preposition, epi, which means to be on or to be upon or to be over. Epi is another familiar prefix that we still use in English. The epidermis is the outer covering of skin over your whole body. An epidemic covers a whole area of people. And epiphany is an appearance from above. The episcopy is an overseer, a bishop or an elder. The epicenter is that place over the focal point of an earthquake. You Californians know about that. Seventh generation. This is filled to overflowing that we talked about. If you take a glass and you fill it with water, you keep filling, 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 filling. 
It's filled to overflowing. And this is the source of spiritual power to fight the spiritual warfare. This is the source of wisdom to encourage and comfort. This is the source of strength to give hope and allow us to stand firm in the face of destruction and opposition. About 100 years ago, an evangelist named Reuben Archer Torrey, R.A. Torrey, said, the baptism of the Holy Spirit imparts power, power for service. This power will not manifest itself precisely the same in each individual. What happened on that first Pentecost after the Lord's resurrection? Different things. Different people received different gifts and empowerments. But there was so much going on that some of the onlookers there thought these guys were drunk. And Peter stood up and he said, standing with the eleven, he raised his voice and he said to them, Men of Judea and all you who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only nine o'clock in the morning. It's only the third hour. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter was telling everybody this prophecy from Joel. That same overflow of the Spirit that they were experiencing there on the day of Pentecost is available to the church today. James 1.17 says that there is no variation or turning, no shadow of turning with God. All you have to do is ask, Father, fill me to overflowing with your Spirit. Seek this power so that you can have the will and the power to do the will of God. Not so you can show off, look at my spiritual gifts, I'm so holy. You don't want to show off the power of God in you. You want to do the will of God by that power. Can you imagine turning the world upside down again? I think we could use that right about now. Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. James 1.16 says, Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning, as we said. The same God that was operating on that first Pentecost after the res resurrection is the same God we serve today. That same spirit that indwelt those believers indwells us now. That same power is available to us. We just have to ask for it. And we have to be baptized in the Spirit. It may not manifest itself the same way as, as uh, R.A. Torrey said, but it's there to be used as is needed. So I hope that you'll take advantage of the power that's there for you, that you'll ask the Lord, fill me, fill me, fill me to overflowing and you'll see a difference. Father, we thank you for this time together again, Lord. We, we ask, Lord, come upon us, fill us with your spirit, empower us to do your will. Give us the ability to do those eternal deeds, not in the power of our own flesh, but in the power of your spirit. We thank you, Father, and we look forward to what you will do. We look forward to the world being turned upside down for you once again, if that's your will. We thank you for this time together now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.